Chapter One Scary Stories Michael Rose had been working for the Lancashire Police for seven years. He loved his job. Because he lived and worked in a small village, he knew many people by name. Even though he was only thirty-three, he was an old-fashioned type of policeman. Friendly, caring, and ready to help. He liked the people of Pendle Lee, and the people of Pendle Lee liked Sergeant Rose. Crime was not a big problem. At the police station, days went by quite slowly. Many other officers liked to be in a bigger town or a city. But Michael loved being part of a small community. The village itself was also a lovely place to live. The church, which was in the centre, had been built in 1376. Many of the houses had been standing for a very long time. Even the pub, which was called the White Witch, was hundreds of years old. At the edge of the village, a river flowed through the fields and woods. On summer evenings, it was as beautiful as a painting. However, there was not very much for young people to do. Bored teenagers were often getting into trouble. In fact, most of the problems Michael had to deal with were caused by teenagers. Loud music, graffiti, and bad behaviour were the main things. Usually, he just talked to the young people and their parents. He hardly ever had to take one of them to the station. In seven years, he had only arrested five people. Yet in those seven years, he had found eleven lost dogs and returned them to their homes. Some policemen would have found that kind of life boring, but Michael was happy. It was the middle of summer. The sun had just set, and it was very late. Michael was at the police station. He was on the night shift. For a few hours, he had been doing some paperwork. Even in a small village station, there was a lot of bureaucracy. He had also had some coffee and had read the newspaper. The police station cat, Harriet, was sitting on his knee. She was purring. Sorry, Harriet, Michael said. You're going to have to move. I want another coffee. He tried to push the fat, tabby cat off his lap. But she didn't want to go. Suddenly, the phone rang. That's strange, Michael thought. Nobody ever called late at night unless something was really wrong. He picked up the phone. Pendle Lee Police Station, he said. Oh, Michael, said a voice he recognised. It was Mrs White, an elderly lady who lived on the edge of the village. I'm sorry it's so late, she said, but there's something happening in the cemetery. Michael sighed. Every now and again, a group of teenagers would gather at the Pendle Lee Cemetery. Wearing black clothes, they would light candles and play loud music. Is it those kids again? Michael asked. Maybe, Mrs. White replied. I can't sleep, and it upsets me that they go to the graveyard. My parents' and grandparents' graves are there. 
Of course, said Michael. I'll go right away. Then maybe you can get some sleep. Around ten minutes later, Michael parked the police car at the cemetery gates. He could hear music. The yellow glow of candles told him where the kids were. He got out of the car and switched on his torch. Next to the gates was a very old house. In the past, the cemetery caretaker had lived in it, but the place had been standing empty for twenty years. Some of the windows were broken. Climbing plants had grown over the building. They had even gone through some of the windows. Two hundred years ago, it had been really pretty. But now it looked like something from a scary movie. Nobody went inside. Birds had made their homes in the empty rooms. Using his torch to light the way, Michael went towards the teenagers. Lots of candles were glowing on the graves. There was loud music, and some of the teenagers were standing in a circle singing. When Michael appeared out of the darkness, he frightened some of them. A girl nearly screamed. Sorry, he said to her. It's only me. Are you trying to make a ghost appear? It's none of your business, said a tall boy. He stepped forward into the torchlight. Michael knew who he was. His name was Alex. He was seventeen years old, and his parents owned the bakery. It is my business, Michael replied. This is a cemetery. It's an important part of this community, and having a party here isn't respectful. The girl who had nearly screamed came across to Michael. We can do what we want, she said. She was trying to sound brave after her fright earlier. Michael recognised her now, Katie Lewis. She was only fourteen, and she should have been at home in bed. What are you doing? Michael asked. Are you trying to make contact with witches? I don't think you'll have any luck tonight. Pendle Lee was in a part of Lancashire that was famous for its witches. In the early 17th century, some women and men from the area had been arrested. It was said that one talked to a black dog that was really the devil. The villagers believed that witches had made some people sick and even killed them. It was believed that cows stopped giving milk because of magic spells. The unlucky women and men were kept in prison at Lancaster Castle. The witches had been hung in 1612. Many people went to watch. Now the witches were seen as ordinary people who were scapegoats of the community. But the stories had continued until the present day. The Lancashire witches brought many tourists to the area. People could buy toy witches. Lancaster Castle even had a special tour of the old prison rooms. And every year, on Halloween, people from all over walked up Pendle Hill in the dark. Pendle Lee had its own stories too. Somewhere about the cemetery. The first graves were over 700 years old. Long before the big Pendle Lee church was built, an even older church existed where the cemetery was. 
the stories told of witches meeting at the place where the old church once stood. It was said that they danced around large fires and tried to see the devil. The ghost of a witch called Agnes Cott was said to haunt the graveyard. Some people said that the caretaker's house was haunted too. Strange noises were heard late at night. Strange lights were seen too, even when the teenagers were in their beds. Michael switched on his torch again. Time to go, he said to the kids, before the ghost of Agnes Cott really does appear. Then you'll all run screaming back home anyway. You can't stop us, said Alex. We'll come back again. The more this community hates us, the happier we are. I'm sorry you feel that way, said Michael. He did understand. There was nothing for teenagers to do in Pendle Lee. He thought that young people's discos at the church hall were a good idea. The villagers were worried about noise and alcohol. However, having teenagers on the streets at night was a bigger problem. After the kids left the graveyard, Michael looked around. There wasn't any graffiti on the graves tonight. In the past, there'd been a problem with graffiti. Even some of the headstones had been smashed. That was a few years ago. Alex and the other young people were angry and bored. But Michael didn't think they would do anything that bad. He decided to keep an eye on them anyway. A few days later, Michael was on a normal afternoon shift. He liked to work during the day, because there was more to do. He could walk around the village and talk to people. He could stop by the different shops and chat with the owners. At the station, other officers would come in from time to time. Even Harriet the cat liked the daytime best. On sunny days, she could lie on the step outside the station. Anybody coming in or going out would have to step over her. Mr. Murphy, an elderly man, had called in at the station to give Michael some beans. Mr. Murphy had grown them himself in his allotment. He was always stopping by with fresh vegetables. Like many older people, he used his allotment for pleasure rather than needing the food. He grew more than he could eat. Michael was just admiring the fresh green beans when his mobile rang. No, Lottie, of course it's not your fault, said Joan. Yes, it is, Lottie exclaimed. Michael raised his hands. Let's stay calm, he said. Chapter 2 Past Life once inside, Michael took out his notebook. Now tell me what happened, he said. No one had come to visit for over two hours, said Joan Potts. It was a slow day. Lottie Bingley sat down behind the reception desk. I'm afraid I left the reception, she said. Every year we have a competition for artists. People from all over Lancashire send in their paintings. This morning we had some new paintings come in and I was very excited. I wanted to see them, even though it's not my job to unpack them. I went upstairs to look. While I was gone, someone came in and stole one of our paintings, 
so it's all my fault. Michael looked all around the room. Don't you have security cameras? he asked. No, Joan replied. It would cost a lot of money. But we never imagined that someone would steal from the Oswald Gallery. And neither of you saw anybody? Michael asked. No, both women replied at the same time. We didn't see or hear anything, said Lottie. Let's have a look at where the painting was hung, Michael said. The women led him into one of the gallery's little rooms. Modern galleries had lots of space and white paint, but the Oswald Gallery was different. The building had many small rooms and halls. The walls were covered in beautiful old wood. The windows were very small. Lottie said, Looking at it makes me feel so calm. It almost feels like you're really there. It's lovely, said Michael. I'll need to keep this photograph for our investigation. Is that okay? Of course, said Lottie. We'll do whatever we can to help. Back inside his car, Michael phoned his boss, Chief Inspector Blake. He gave Blake all the information he had so far. The inspector was very busy. Michael could tell he wasn't very interested in a painting stolen from a village gallery. The city had more crime than the police could deal with. They should have had security cameras, Blake said angrily. He told Michael to contact the Art Loss Register. It kept an international database of art that had been stolen or lost. If a rich person or museum wanted to buy a piece of art, they could find out if it was stolen through the register. If it was, the buyer could alert the police. The thief, who was trying to sell the art, could then be caught. It was hard to find stolen art. Sometimes the buyer knew it was stolen, but didn't care. Sometimes a group of thieves would plan a big burglary and then wait for many years before selling the art in places like Africa or South America. Can you deal with this? Blake asked Michael. I don't have another officer who can come down there right now. It's too bad we have to send you a crime scene officer just to take some fingerprints. I still think it's a good idea, Michael said. The inspector was often in a bad mood, and Michael was glad he didn't have to work in the city with him. You know we're on terror alert, don't you? Blake went on. We may have to send officers to Manchester or London at any moment. You too, Sergeant. I know, Michael replied. Leave everything to me, Inspector. I'll send you my reports. After the phone call was finished, Michael opened the car window. He took a deep breath of fresh air. Then he looked at the photograph of Summer again. The young woman in the picture was very pretty. She had long, wavy, blonde hair. She looked out across the fields. Michael wondered if the woman had been real or if she had come from the painter's imagination. Michael 
was soon back at the station. He immediately contacted the Art Loss Register. He informed them about the stolen painting and gave all the details. Then he went out and interviewed the villagers. He was hoping someone had seen something strange, like someone hurrying away from the village. Meanwhile, the crime scene officer was exploring the gallery. If fingerprints were found, they would be put into the police fingerprint database. If the thief had done anything wrong before, his or her prints would be in the database. They would match with the prints from the crime scene. Then the police would have a name. Over the next two days, Michael was busy. He put up signs about the burglary. The signs asked people, with any information, to call the police or the National Crime Stoppers number. Michael thought it was strange that both paintings were of the same woman. There were many Butterworth pictures that showed landscapes or still life scenes. Only a few had the young woman in them. Perhaps that was a clue. Who was she? Michael asked when he called Joan that night. Don't you know? asked Joan. It's Sylvia. Sylvia and Tristan Butterworth got married in 1950. She was very beautiful and was his model for some of his paintings. Maybe, if we find out more about Sylvia Butterworth, it might give us a clue, Michael said. Perhaps the thief wants to collect paintings of her. Good idea, said Joan. Maybe he's obsessed with her. We have an archive at the gallery. It has a lot of information about Sylvia in it. You can look at it if you like. The next day, after his afternoon shift, Michael went back to the Oswald Gallery. It had been closed, and there were plans to buy security cameras. The risk of someone getting hurt again was too big. Joan took Michael upstairs to a small office. It was filled with filing cabinets. This is the Butterworth archive, Joan said. The filing cabinets are full of photographs and letters. They belong to both Tristan and Sylvia. There are also lots of papers about Butterworth's paintings and exhibitions. You can look through them if you like. Joan made him a cup of coffee. On the backs of the pictures were the words Honeymoon, Cumbria, 1950. The couple looked very happy. Some of the photographs showed other people too. There were many that had been taken on the terrace of a house. Michael thought it was the same terrace as in Evening in June. In the photos, lots of people were standing around. They had glasses of wine and cigarettes. In other photos, the same people were sitting under a tree, having a picnic. Behind them, the Pendlee River flowed. Everyone was smiling at the camera. There were a few pictures of Butterworth with another man. The pictures said Nigel and Tristan, with different places and dates. There were also pictures of Nigel and Sylvia. Next, he looked at some old letters. There were lots from Sylvia to Tristan. Michael began to read. He read for a long time. When he looked at his watch, he had been reading for over an hour. He had been in a different world. 
It seemed as though Sylvia was writing to him. He put down the letters and picked up some different ones. All of them were to Sylvia from a man named Nigel Huxley. Some were dated from 1941 to 1944 and had been sent from France. Michael looked through them quickly. Huxley had written about being a soldier in World War II. Now he was a thief, just like the person who had taken the paintings. Michael had spent many hours in the archive, and it was now night time. On his way home, he drove past the cemetery. He was worried that the teenagers were there again. Suddenly, he saw something. It looked like the glow from a candle or a torch. It seemed to be moving among the graves. Those kids, Michael said out loud. He looked at his watch. 12.16 a.m. Michael stopped the car at the gates and got out his torch. Then he went into the cemetery. The light seemed to have disappeared. He listened, but he couldn't hear anything. The moon was shining brightly, and the air smelled like cut grass and old flowers. He walked on. The graves looked quite scary in the dark. Although he didn't believe in ghosts, Michael didn't feel very brave. It was like a graveyard scene from a scary movie. Suddenly, he got angry. The teenagers were probably hiding from him. Maybe Alex and his friends were all sitting behind the headstones, waiting for him to go away. They probably thought this was funny. Michael decided to switch off his torch and wait for the kids to come out. The moonlight helped him to see quite well. Chapter 3 Young Woman with Flowers When Michael finally opened his eyes, his clothes were wet from lying in the grass for a long time. He put his hand to his head. When he looked at his hand, there was something dark on his fingers. Blood. He felt sick and his head hurt. His torch was lying on the ground, but it wasn't working anymore. Michael looked around. He didn't know what to do. The best thing would be to call his boss, then go to the hospital and get a doctor to look at him. He stood up. All he wanted to do was get into bed. Slowly he went back to his car and drove home. Early the next morning, Michael went to the station. He wrote a report about what happened in the graveyard. His head still hurt badly, but he didn't want to spend the day waiting to see a doctor. Instead, he called the hospital about Lottie. She was still unconscious, and the doctors were doing all sorts of tests. After the hospital call, he phoned the homes of Alex and some of the other teenagers from the cemetery. He asked their parents to bring them down to the station as soon as possible. If Alex had hit Michael, he was in serious trouble. Then he arranged for another officer to talk to the teenagers. Although Michael wanted to talk to Alex, 
and the others himself. He was a witness to a crime. He couldn't be the questioning officer too. Then Michael searched the internet for Nigel Huxley. Huxley might have information about the paintings or Sylvia. He found out that Huxley had also been an artist. He was a sculptor, but he was not as famous as Butterworth. His last sculpture was made in 1967. Do you want to see Mr. Huxley? Yes, please, if he's at home, Michael replied. You'd better come in, said the housekeeper. Michael followed her into the house. Wait here, the housekeeper pointed to a chair by the door. She wasn't friendly at all. Michael wondered if she ever smiled. He sat down. The big hall was painted a light green. The floor was made of gorgeous dark wood. In the corner stood a large sculpture. Michael couldn't really tell what it was. It could have been a woman with long wavy hair. Or a tree. Whatever it was, it looked very modern. Suddenly the housekeeper appeared again. You can see Mr. Huxley now, she said. He's in the living room. Nigel Huxley sat in a big chair. He didn't look eighty-five at all. He seemed a lot younger. But perhaps that was because of his bright blue eyes. He looked intelligent and full of energy. I'm sorry about my housekeeper, Huxley said. She's not very nice to visitors, even policemen. Michael looked around the living room. The sun was shining through the large windows. There were two huge sofas and a few chairs. In the middle of the room was a round table. Lots of books were everywhere, on the table, on bookshelves, and on the floor. There was also a beautiful old fireplace. So you've come to question me, he said. Good detective work, Sergeant Rose. It's true. I was in love with Sylvia. She and I grew up together. Our families were friends. We lived in the same village and went to the same church. Even when I was a teenager, I loved her. I met Tristan Butterworth at art school. Sylvia would model for us both. Then the Second World War started. I became a soldier. But Tristan couldn't join the army. He had polio when he was a baby, and there was something wrong with his leg. While I was in France, Tristan and Sylvia fell in love. I wanted them to be happy, so we stayed friends. What happened to Tristan and Sylvia? Michael asked. He'd almost forgotten about the stolen art. The Butterworths moved to America in the 1960s, Huxley went on. Michael had to leave. He thanked Huxley for his time. On his way out to the car again, he thought about the old man. Firstly, he seemed obsessed with Sylvia and collected paintings of her. Secondly, he was familiar with the Oswald Gallery and lived close by. Thirdly, he didn't want the police looking around his house. Michael decided to call Chief Inspector Blake to find out if he could get a search warrant for the mansion. 
he still kept the photo of Sylvia in his wallet. Every now and then, he took it out and looked at it. Before he left for the gallery, he called Joan Potts. He wanted to let her know that he would visit the archive. Now that the gallery was closed, she believed the paintings would be safe. However, she was still happy to know that a policeman was around. Chapter 4 Voices in the Dark By the time Michael got to the Oswald Gallery, the sun had nearly disappeared. He parked his car right in front of the door and was shocked about what he saw. There was graffiti all over the front of the building. It was the same yellow paint that he'd seen at the caretaker's house and the same symbols. Then he saw the broken window. The hole was big enough for someone to climb through, but bits of glass were still sharp. The robber had probably been hurt. Michael looked through the broken window. A big rock from the garden was lying inside on the wooden floor. Bits of broken glass were everywhere. On one piece of glass, he saw something red. It looked like blood. The thief had been cut. This meant that the police could get an important DNA clue. It made a small trail across the floor and into the hall. Michael followed it. The trail went up the stairs, along the hall and into another room. It stopped in front of a wall. There was an empty space where a painting once hung. Suddenly there was a shout from downstairs. The two other policemen had arrived. Michael went downstairs and greeted them. He told them about the trail of blood and the stolen painting. Can you go through the rest of the building? he asked the constable, whose name was John Ritchie. I'm going to look in the garden. I'll get fingerprints and blood, said the crime scene officer. But I don't think we'll get a match. There were no matches on our fingerprint database last time. Just as Michael was about to go outside, the constable called him back. You're the one who was hit in the graveyard, aren't you? he asked. I talked to those teenagers. Every single one has an alibi. Even Alex, who is an angry young man. One day he'll end up arrested for something, believe me. He immediately stopped walking and listened. He wondered if it was a small animal making noises in the dark. But then he heard a voice. Another voice answered. Two people were hiding in the woods. Michael took out his phone and called PC Ritchie. He spoke very quietly and quickly. The constable agreed to join him. In less than a minute, the constable was there, walking softly through the trees. Then they both switched off their torches. After a few moments, their eyes could see better in the darkness. They quietly walked towards the sound of voices. Two people were hiding in some bushes underneath a tree. 
They were dressed all in black and had long black hair. This just made their white faces stand out even more in the dark. Michael recognised two young men from the cemetery. He gave a shout. The boys looked around and saw the officers, then jumped up and started to run. Michael and P.C. Ritchie raced after them through the trees. I hate the pigs, said the boy, using the insulting word for policemen. The police would wait until daylight to search the woods for the stolen painting. Michael didn't want to let the boys go until then, but he had to. There was no reason for arresting them. They were checked for cuts because of the broken glass in the gallery window. But neither of the boys had been cut anywhere on their bodies. They were in lots of trouble about the graffiti, but Michael didn't think anything serious would happen to them. He let them go home with their parents. Back at his desk, he made some notes for his report. Then he made a list of things to do in the morning. At the top was the search warrant for Nigel Huxley's home. He wanted to visit the old sculptor as soon as possible. He wanted to have some of Huxley's blood for testing too. The investigators could match it against the blood from the gallery. Next, he wanted to take Joan Potts to the gallery to ask her about the stolen painting. He was sure it was another one of Sylvia. Then he wanted to go to the hospital to see if Lottie had any memories of the robbery. Immediately, Michael started to run to the old house. Alex ran too. It's Katie, Alex exclaimed. She went into the house for a dare. Can't you kids stay out of trouble? Michael shouted as he ran. When he got to the house, he tried to open the door. It was still locked. She went through a window, said Alex. Together they ran to the side of the building. Just then, Katie screamed again. Michael found the window. It was old-fashioned, and the old wood had made it easy to open from the outside. He shone his torch inside and called Katie's name. He saw her rush into the room, looking very frightened. When she saw Michael and Alex, she started to cry and immediately tried to climb through the window. Michael helped her. Once outside, Katie fell on the ground. She lay on the grass. It's the witch, she said. She couldn't stop crying. What did she look like? Alex asked. He was choking on heavy smoke. He looked around, confused. Then he saw her. A woman was going up the stairs. He had no time. The fire was going to burn the old building down. He ran up the stairs. He could see quite well because of the orange glow from the fire. When he got to the top, he saw her standing very still, looking at him. For a moment, he thought that Katie was right. The woman was a witch. Agnes Cott, he thought. She had long, grey hair 
and dirty old clothes. She looked very old. Michael told her his name. I'm here to help you, he said. She turned and ran down the corridor. Michael followed her. He could see smoke from the fire coming up the stairs. He went into one of the bedrooms. Although it was darker in the room, he could see the old woman. She was trying to pick up some large, flat objects. When Michael got closer, he saw that the objects were paintings. On every one, he recognised Sylvia. The old woman looked at Michael and started to cry. Please help me, she said. Two months later, after his evening shift, Michael left the station. He walked up the road. When he got to the old people's home, he stopped. Nigel Huxley was waiting for him. It was the same every Wednesday and Sunday. The two men went inside together. Sometimes Sylvia couldn't remember their names. She couldn't remember pushing Lottie down the stairs or laughing and knocking Michael out in the graveyard. For weeks, she'd been living in the old caretaker's cottage. She stole things to eat, as well as the paintings. She mainly remembered things that happened sixty years ago. Michael knew she had been beautiful then, although he couldn't tell from looking at the old woman now. Her eyes are the one thing that hasn't changed, Michael said to Nigel, looking at the photo of Sylvia in his wallet. They're still beautiful, Michael said to Nigel, looking at the photo of Sylvia in his wallet. They're still beautiful. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.